While we realize that we shall have close association with Elder Bruce R. McConkie in our future work with the missions of the Church and shall partake of his wisdom and spirituality, we also know that we shall miss him more than any of us care to admit. We assure him of our love, our loyalty, and our support. We also welcome Elder Rex Pinniger to our Council and feel certain that his ability will add strength to us as we go forward. I shall speak about genealogy. William Lee came from the old sod in 1745. He must have had an unexplained urge because he wouldn't know really why he came. He might think it was to better his condition. He fought in the American Revolution and was wounded. A lot of our ancestors had fought in the Revolution, but none of them were wounded. He was left for dead in the Battle of Guilford Courthouse in the Carolinas in March 1781. Thanks to good nursing, he recovered, and like all good endings, married his nurse. <laughs> Four sons came to him, one of whom was Samuel, who was the youngest. Samuel's sons, Francis, Alfred, and Eli, and their families joined the church in 1832, about the time that my great-grandfather joined. They suffered through all the vicissitudes of the troubles and the persecutions and mobbings of Jackson County, far west and Nauvoo, and finally, of course, came west. At winter quarters, their father joined them. He had not joined the church up till this time, but joined shortly afterward. Francis, the youngest of these, or Francis, maybe the eldest, married a young woman by the name of Jane Vale Johnson. I shall speak of her later. They all came to Utah and settled in Tooele County. They were just getting settled and making things go when they were called by President Brigham Young to St. George. And they went, like all good Latter-day Saints did in those days. But they hadn't been in St. George very long when they were called to settle Meadow Valley. That's a place you folks probably haven't heard about. It's now known as Panaka. In what they thought was southwestern Utah, but which actually later came to be in Nevada. And these people, obeying again the call without question, were the first, was the first family to move to Meadow Valley and they made a dugout house. Sister Young said to me, no one will know what a dugout house is. I said, most of the folks will. You take a hillside and dig out a hole and cover some roof over it, and that's it. Troubles with the few of the settlers, the few settlers there were with the Indians, caused the authorities of St. George to give them permission to abandon the project. But Sister Jane Johnson Lee refused to leave. She said she was there to stay, and stay they did. Later, two Indians came into her dugout home, and one of them, seeing a rifle in one corner of the room, demanded it. Sister Lee refused to give it to him. He started for the gun, but she struck him so hard with a piece of stove wood that knocked him down. <laughs> he staggered to his feet and drew his bow, aiming an arrow at her. She let him have another piece of wood, which smashed the bow and arrow. <laughs> Both Indians departed. <laughs> Two sons of this brave couple married sisters. Samuel Marion Lee married Margaret McMurrin, and Francis Lee Jr. married Mary McMurrin. The McMurrins were converts from Scotland who had crossed the plains with the handcart companies. Brother McMurrin, a cooper, which is a man who fixes barrels and bends wood, repaired many a handcart wheel en route, while he which helped get the carts to the valley but delayed him and his family. They also settled in Tuwili. 
Each of the Lee brothers took his bride to Meadow Valley. I speak of Margaret's bravery. Eleven times she placed her life upon the block and offered it that children might be born. No sterile chamber where the doctor waits, the anesthetic cone and nurse in readiness could be her lot. The cabin walls absorbed the agonizing cries with death close by. But he did not claim her life. Instead, he took each child, each little one, to heaven, all eleven. Then came the twelfth. For her the light burned dim, then flickered low and out. But she had filled her life and given all that she could give. Her mission was performed. A son was born the only child to live. He was named after his father's name, Samuel Lee. Mary McMurrin Lee took the child and let them nurse along with her own child. But after a time, the strain was too great. So they took the baby to Salt Lake to Grandmother McMurrin. I'll give him one last nursing, she said. And then, laying him in his crib, went back to Meadow Valley. Under his grandmother's care, the baby Samuel grew into a stalwart boy, and when 16, went to Clifton, Idaho, in Cache Valley, where he worked on a farm, and there later met Janetta, I guess it's Janetta, maybe Jeanette, I like it better, Janetta, so I should pronounce it that way, <laughs> Bingham. Out on the farm, Jeanette Bingham grew and blossomed, into girlish womanhood. Her eyes caught the color of the somber hills in spring, and in the fall they danced with joy at, at autumn's coloring. At home she learned to wash and cook and sew, and winter saw her skating, sledding, riding in the bobsleigh through the snow. Then Samuel Lee, now working on this nearby farm, watched her grow saw with his heart as well as with his eyes the slow unfolding of her girlish charm, the bloom of girlhood high upon her cheeks, a budding woman, gentle, soft, and warm. And she saw him, the young, strong, steady hands, the head well set, the shoulders square and broad, the muscles strong and firm. A good young man, she knew his story well, the twelfth and only child to live. And so they came together, drawn by a magnet neither one could see, to be the parents of a man of destiny. And so in good time and in his turn there came into the family circle on a windy day in late March 1898 a son. They named him Harold Bingham Lee. It is fitting this day that we speak briefly of this heritage. The Lord prepared the lineage through which President Lee came, that he might inherit their bravery, their loyalty, their integrity, and their devotion to the truth. 2,572 years ago, give or take a year, a prophet accepted of the Lord began to write his history. I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents. And then he went on to say, I make a record of my proceedings in my day. And so the first prophet of our times might have said the same words. I, Joseph Smith, having been born of goodly parents, make my record. Now so it is today. Beginning his work as a prophet of the Lord, this modern seer and revelator may thus also begin his history. I, Harold Bingham Lee, having been born of goodly parents, begin my work. Prophets are born of goodly parents. Before the earth was formed, the heavenly host gave shouts of joy, both because they could come to the earth and that their leaders were chosen and recognized. Each of us who are parents 
have children who have children. Maybe they may have, they may have children of prophets or sons of prophets. Let us raise them in truth and virtue. Said the Lord, Abraham, thou art one of them. Thou wast chosen before thou wast born. And the Lord designated the others who have been chosen. I do not presume. I am sure, President Lee, when I testify thou wast chosen before thou wast born. I pray the whisperings of the Spirit, the visions of eternity, the mighty words of Christ our Lord will come to and be with you, even as it was with Nephi and with Joseph Smith. And I pray too that the layman's and the yet lemuels will lose their power to hurt or make afraid. I know that presently is a prophet and a seer and a revelator. I have seen with my own eyes the mantle fall upon him and have had the witness borne into my soul that the Lord has chosen him and sustains him. God our Father, through his Son Jesus Christ, directs the work of this, the true and living Church, established by the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth. I know it and bear witness of it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. <laughs>